As we're seated, friends, let's first say our centering prayer this morning. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, may your will be done through me. And you may be seated. And as you're seated, I want to tell you the story about Johnny, little Johnny. Little Johnny uh, wanted a new bike. He wanted a new bike really badly. And so he went to his, uh, his pastor. And he said, Pastor, I want a new bike really badly. And, and I want to pray for a new bike. But I just kind of feel that praying for a new bike is, you know, it's kind of the wrong thing to do. God's got so many important petitions going on. So the pastor said, okay, well, what are you going to do if you're not going to pray for a new bike? Johnny said, I got an idea. I'm going to steal the bike and then ask for forgiveness. <laughs> Which as we begin to unpack forgiveness today, we know that many of us have some grudges that we came in with. We have a boss who promoted somebody beneath us. We have a house we were bidding on in this market, but somebody came on and scooped it out from under us. We have presents that we researched for three months that we took two months to, 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 to save up for, and that son, daughter, relative still hasn't said thank you. We have, of course, built up resentments and grudges against uh, poli political division, a politician you don't like saying things that really, really get to you. We have, we have these natural disasters happening in which we look at God and we say, why, why, why the floods? Why the fires? Why the earthquakes? And then, of course, maybe worse if you're like me, is the anger, the, the, the forgiveness that we need to aim at ourselves. Because I made a mistake. It cost me my job, house, marriage. What are you going to fill in the blank with? Because very often, the hardest person forgive, to forgive is ourselves. And so the title of today's message is Bless Them is bless them. Because as we look at Jesus' idea of forgiveness, it's not just to say, I'm going to let you off the hook, I'm going to put up with you, but it's that I'm going to pray for you, I'm going to forgive you, I'm going to bless you. And that in us, we have that power, because we have the power of God inside of us, we have that power that God has given us to forgive like God forgives. The world doesn't understand it, but we're not of the world, friends. We're of God. And that power that you have inside of you, that you can tap into, is here to liberate you, to revitalize you, to refresh you, to reinvigorate you. Because I tell you, carrying around unforgiveness is a non-starter. So I, I wonder this morning, as I was putting my homily together, I wonder uh, how many of you were reading the news this week about that convict in Pennsylvania who escaped for like two weeks, and he was like on the run, on the prowl. He was a pretty bad dude. I mean, he had uh, quite a record. He was incarcerated for good reason. He's not only convicted for life on what he did, but he's also got other charges against him probably coming up for similar things. And it's in the headlines now. We're going to read about it, and they're going to lock him up. They're going to throw away the key. But soon the news cycle will take over, and something else will come up. And we'll be paying attention to something else in the news. But you know who's not going to forget about that? His family members and the victim's family members. They're going to have to carry that with them for their entire lives. They're going to have to find a way to live with that unforgiveness, with that forgiveness, which is something we all get because we have people very close to us who it's difficult to forgive because they've offended us. They've said something bad about us. They've done something to us. And we have to find a way to live with those people, which is what was on Peter's mind this morning when Peter came to Jesus and said, hey, how often should I forgive somebody? Should I do it even like seven times? And some translations like ours said 77 times. Others say seven times 70, which is even more. But in, 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 in Hebrew, those numbers seven and 70 mean a lot. And what, what they mean together, most theologians will tell you, is infinity is you can't stop forgiving somebody. Now, God, why would you make that a rule? Like, why can't I just have like one or two people that I can't forgive? Why do I have to keep forgiving everybody? And I think the reason God gives that to us is because God wants the best for us. God wants to see you prosper. God wants to see you healthy. God wants to see you go through life with all the joy you desire for your children or grandchildren or loved ones in your life. God wants you to forgive 
because holding on to unforgiveness will eat you alive. What's the quote, Judy, that we like? Unforgiveness is like drinking rat poison and waiting for the rat to die, right? Very often, the people that offended you, they don't care about you. They've offended you, they'll do it again, right? One of the best definitions in reading up for this that I came across uh, of, of forgiveness was forgiveness is accepting an apology that's never been given. Forgiveness is accepting an apology that has never been given. And so I think God wants us to participate in forgiveness because it's good for us. When we let it go, your blood pressure goes down. You'll sleep better. You'll be nicer to other people. You won't feel badly around that other person, right? And so uh, if, if you're interested in doing a deeper dive in forgiveness, Google a guy named Everett Worthington. Everett Worthington is one of the foremost academics in studying forgiveness. And he came up with something called the REACH model, R-E-A-C-H, REACH. And he says that when you have an incident, something in your life that you want to forgive, you go through those five steps. And so, so let's take the time, Ellen, when you borrowed my lawnmower. <laughs> That's what she gets for sitting so close. You borrowed my lawnmower, my $500 lawnmower, my Husqvarna lawnmower, and you borrowed it and you never returned it. Okay, and you live right next door. So every time I like see you, I'm like, Ellen, like, where is it? And it's been long enough, and I, I've finally decided that I need to forgive somebody of their transgression. And so what uh, Worthington would say is your first step is, is the R, which means to recall the events. And what's meant by that is not just remembering when you came over and you asked to borrow the lawnmower, which I have run through my memory bank 17 times since you did it, but it's also asking my wife, who was at the house at the same time, and asking others around who witnessed that event and try to recall that event with the, the most detachment I can get. Because over time, you know, you become a demon, right? And so I want to recall that event, but I want to recall it appropriately. I want to recall that event. And then we move from R to E, which is so important, and that's the word empathy. Because I need to step back and say, you know what, Ellen borrowed that lawnmower the day after she lost her job and her cat died and she got an eviction notice. And, and, and all these things are true. I'm giving away pastoral secrets here. <laughs> but the idea is how can we empathetically understand that person that's so hard to forgive? I've gone through that in my life. Somebody hard to forgive. What, what was going on in their mind? Why would they hold on to the lawnmower? Why wouldn't they give it back to me? And then REA, the third is then participate in this altruistic work of forgiveness is to say to the best of your ability, I'm gonna let it go. I'm gonna let Ellen off the hook. I'm gonna treat Ellen as if nothing happened. I am going to forgive her. I'm not gonna forget her. She doesn't get my lawnmower again. Because <laughs> forgiving and forgetting, remember, aren't the same thing. But I'm going to actually just let that go, which is why the next two steps have to do with that tough, tough stuff that you and I live with, which is, of course, continuing to remind ourselves that I've forgiven her, maybe getting a prayer partner or, or a mentor to talk with and say, I'm trying to forgive this person, help me. <laughs> Writing a journal, we're good at that. And then of course, number five, R-E-A-C-H, is hold on to forgiveness. Hold on to that forgiveness, say, you know what? I'm not gonna let it keep me up at night. I'm not gonna let it affect my blood pressure. But I'm gonna go through those steps. And those steps are really important because they're 10 cent transgressions and they're $10,000 transgressions. If it's 10 cents, it's probably forgotten by dinner time. <laughs> But when it's $10,000, it's something that you live with. And so I, I want to talk a little bit about what, what has happened in, in, in Libya with those dams. Because as I've watched the news, if you've watched the news, we've seen those images of desperation, of, of just, uh, you know, the, 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 the land um, all, all beat up by the floods and the people and the people and the people. And one woman in particular shaking her fist I don't, I don't know Arabic, but it may have been something similar to what I would say, which is, why did you do this, God? Why did you do this, God? And she stands as an icon for all of us who at any point in our life have asked, why didn't I get that job? Why didn't that person I really liked return my phone call? Why didn't I get that raise? Why didn't my health report come back better? Why, why, why? Because all of us at some point in our life Blame God. And when we blame God, we have to first of all look at, at, well, you know, do I understand God well enough to blame God? 
right? It's, it's, it's the quintessential question we all ask, why do bad things happen to good people? Why do good things happen to bad people? And we never really have a good answer. And I wish we lived in a world that gave us a good answer. It's my puzzle analogy. God has given us a box. It's a puzzle. It's a thousand pieces is what it says on the outside, but you get the box, there's no picture on the front, and you open it and there are 400 pieces. That's what life is like. We don't get the full picture, we don't get all the pieces. So we get mad, and we turn to the book of Psalms, that gives us a good vocabulary for being mad at God. I'm not against us shaking our fist in our distress, in our pain, and getting mad at God. But I do want to remind us of something beautiful that God did when God created us. And that is that God gave us a default setting, a factory setting that says it feels good to do good. It feels good to do good. Getting mad at God does not feel good. Living a life of anger and resentment and vengeance against anybody, much less the Almighty, is not going to be good for you. So after you've had your party, after you've gotten good and angry, after you've gotten to a certain level, click over to your factory setting. Look at that mess on the kitchen floor and start putting those pieces back together again. That's what you're made to do, to repair. It feels good to do good. A gift from God to you and me as we deal with our anger towards God. Some of you have heard me talk about my dear friend Marianne who died in May. Marianne was about my age, but when she was 22 years old, she was driving her car outside Oxford, Ohio. She's a graduate student. She was going off to the beach. And a little boy named Brian, eight years old, was playing in a yard nearby. And he didn't pay attention to the traffic, and he ran right in front of my friend Marianne. And that, uh, that uh, fatality effect, affected Marianne for the rest of her life. A day did not go by in which she thought of Brian, in which she thought of, what if I'd gone at a different time? What if I'd slowed down? What if I, what if I, what if I? Like, you've never asked that question. And so through uh, the first 20 years she went through this, she just buried it. Um, she got married, the marriage didn't last, she didn't want to have kids, she kept thinking about Brian. Uh, went through a lot of therapy. Uh, finally, after 20 years, she began a website and an organization that I'm a part of that helps people who harm people support one another. And in our work together, uh, we would frequently be in conversation with people who'd done things in which they could not forgive themselves. They'd done something as serious as, 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 as hit and kill a child. I'm sure if we took a poll out here, we have a number of us who could mention things in which we can't forgive ourselves. Now our gospel here makes it clear that we are to forgive ourselves. We're to forgive God, we're to forgive our neighbor. We are to do that. But we're also realists here, and we understand that like Marianne, when she was famously asked on several occasions, have you forgiven yourself? She would say, I'm working on it. But while I can't yet forgive myself, I am having compassion for myself. And so I invite you, as you go through that difficult work of forgiving yourself, if you can't do it, at least be nicer to yourself. Talk to yourself better. Don't put yourself in the penalty box all the time. You're doing the very best that you can. God's word to you today is compassion. Move along that road of self-forgiveness, but do so not beating yourself up. I look so ugly, I can never do that. I'd never buy that, I don't deserve it. I'd never live there, I can't deserve it. The Bible is very clear in calling us to our best. You are royalty, you are blessed, you are highly favored. But if you can't believe that, at least be nice to yourself. You know, the most iconic story we heard today, Lori Pinson read to us from the Fox 2 weather room. If you were looking up at the lectern, that's where she was. And it's this wonderful story of the Exodus. And we all know the story. The Hebrew slaves had grown in number in Egypt, and Pharaoh was getting really scared that, oh my gosh, there are going to be so many of them. They're going to take over the government. So he got, uh, he, he got really, really um, down on them and kept telling them to make more bricks with less hay. And they were so, so abused. And, um, and, and punished, that God heard their cries is what the scripture says. And when God heard their cries, God sent Moses. Moses, through a series of events, got the Israelites out of Egypt and got them to the Red Sea, where, as we heard today, the Red Sea was parted and God miraculously provided for them. 
wherever you are in your work of forgiveness today, forgiving somebody else, forgiving God, forgiving yourself, that same God who delivered the Israelites is here to deliver you. Whatever you're holding on to today, God has the power to do the impossible, the unimaginable, the amazing. I believe that as you and I encompass this uh, divine forgiveness that we have in our hearts, as we begin to tap into that more and more, and we begin to pray for, to forgive, to bless them who have persecuted us, I believe we're going to lead more peaceful lives. I really do. We'll have more peace in our hearts as we're able to forgive other people. I believe as we're able to tap into that power to forgive more and more, connecting with God more deeply, we'll be able to pray for and to, and, and to, and, and, and to bless those and, and to bless God as God is often the one that we blame. And when we're able to do that, I believe that our community can be a better place. And I think that we're, as we're able to tap into that forgiveness that God has in our hearts more deeply, we will be able to pray for, we will be able to, to, uh, to forgive and to bless those around us that our world will be a better place. So friends, I commend you to tap into that forgiving power. I think as we bring heaven to earth by forgiving other people, it is the joy of humanity, it is the power of God, and if you believe it, I want to hear you say amen. Amen, I want you to stand up, and Steve, go ahead, put our affirmation of faith onto our screens.